virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity and now virgin most powerful radio is pleased to present hands-on apologetics with renowned catholic author and apologist gary machuda Great to be with you today to do this thing we call Hands on Apologetics, where we learn how to explain, defend the faith with clarity, charity, and confidence. Welcome aboard, everybody. It's great to be with you. Uh, you know what? Let's start out giving my shout outs. I want to welcome all of you watching live stream, Facebook, YouTube, all the other platforms we live stream on. Welcome aboard, folks. Good to see you. Also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the country and also via podcast around the world through our, uh, well, either through our handy-dandy phone app or through our flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Check it out, folks. Go to our shows, scroll down to Hands-On Apologetics, and bang, you have all the shows there that you can select and share with uh, people you know. And, uh, by the way, thank you so much, everybody, for subscribing, liking, telling people about the program. You know, we are... We are growing, and that's all because of you. And it's all because of you doing what I call apologetics in place or evangelism in place. Why not? You know, it's a, it's a, do it in the comfort of your own home. And who knows, one click of your mouse could possibly save a soul, at least save a soul from error. So if you like a program, please share it with people. And uh, by the way, speaking of programs, we got a cool program in store for you today. We're going to have former Church of Christ minister Bruce Sullivan come on board. Bruce is a favorite of our show. He's a great guy. He wrote the book uh, Christ and His Fullness, which is an excellent book because there's so few resources out there on uh, Church of Christ because in some ways Churches of Christ uh, have a lot of Catholic understandings of things and other things they don't. And one of those things they don't is uh, understanding the role of priests and bishops. And that's what's the topic going to be today. You know, the New Testament talks about the uh, uh, episcopoi and the presbyteroi, you know, the, the elders, the overseers. Uh, it's not really clear exactly what bishops and priests mean or elders mean in the New Testament. And, of course, Church of Christ, uh, they go by patternism where scripture is kind of like the blueprint for the Christian church to follow. And uh, so it's not really clear exactly what are these roles. So Bruce is going to come on. He's going to share with us how he kind of worked through this issue. And that's going to be very, very interesting. I'm going to be taking notes throughout. And uh, as always, you know, Bruce Sullivan's just a, not only a wealth of information, but he's just a on fire guy. I believe he's entering into the diaconate. I got to check with him to see if actually he, he entered the diaconate in the Catholic Church. So he's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Also, as always, we do our critical thinking exercises via the Finding the Fallacy segment. Today's Finding the Fallacy is the equivocation fallacy. That's a fun one. And we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. Also, we meet a very early church father today, extremely important early church father in terms of a witness to the the original faith of Christians from the very beginning. It is none other than St. Ignatius of Antioch. You've heard it many, many times on the show. St. Ignatius is quoted. We're going to learn a little bit about him and uh, all that good stuff coming up. So great stuff in, show, in store for us. I hope you enjoy yourselves. And why don't we jump into the Finding the Fallacies segment, which is equivocation. One of my favorite fallacies just because uh, it is the fallacy upon which a lot of humor turns, you know, comedy turns largely on equivocation. So what is equivocation? In logic, equivocation is an informal fallacy resulting in the use of a particular word or expression in multiple senses within an argument. 
it is a type of ambiguity that stems from a phrase having two distinct meanings, not from the grammar or the structure of the sentence. For example, uh, words have many different meanings, and that is that ambiguity of possibly having one meaning or another meaning can sometimes wreck an argument because if you don't use the same term with the same meaning throughout the argument, uh, you can make something that may sound correct but actually is totally wrong. So equivocation is where you kind of equivocate on the meaning. You use it in one sense in one part of the argument and you use another sense in the other part of the argument. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, like I said, humor, comedy today, a lot of it is based on equivocation. So uh, they'll take a word and then they'll use it in a different sense, applying it to the wrong context, things like that. So, for example, um, uh, ships are the most, uh, ships have the best access to cash. Why? Because they're always near a bank. Aha, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> That, that's equivocating, of course, on the word bank, which can mean uh, where the shore meets the water, or it could mean a financial institution. So that's a equivocation on bank. You get the drift. So whenever you're listening to someone giving an argument, make sure that they're using the term in the same meaning throughout the argument. Otherwise, they commit the finding of the fallacy of today, which is the equivocation fallacy. Okay, let's jump to the Meet the Early Church Father, who is St. Ignatius of Antioch, who flourished around uh, AD 110. Very early church father, an apostolic father. St. Ignatius was the third bishop of Antioch, succeeding St. Evodius, who was the immediate successor of St. Peter. He is accounted an apostolic father by reason of him being a hearer of the Apostle John. So it's during the reign of Trajan, between AD 98 and 117, and probably around the year 110, where he was sentenced to the beast in the arena. On his journey from Antioch to Rome to and martyrdom, he wrote seven letters, his only extent uh, authentic writings. Almost everything of, a, of what's little is known about him is gleaned from these letters, and his dresses... Uh, several early Christian communities. In fact, some of these you'll remember are mentioned in the New Testament. Ephesus, there's Magnesia, Trellis, Rome, Philadelphia, and Smyrna. And he also wrote a personal letter to the Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna. And so we have these seven letters, and they're really remarkable letters. I highly recommend you read them, especially during Lent. I mean, they really make good Lenten reading. Uh, the most important of these letters is that to Rome, yet all seven of them are veritable treasure houses for the history of dogma, uh, chiefly because the letters present so clearly a hierarchical and monarchical church. So early on, like 110 AD, the authenticity of these letters, authenticity of these letters have long been questioned by Protestant scholars. However, the, genuine, uh, the genuinity of these uh, letters has now essentially been vindicated. It's, uh, now everybody believes them to be authentic. And that was done by people like J.B. Lightfoot, Adolf von Harnack, Theodore Zahn, and also F.X. Funk as well. Uh, the text of letters, they come in three distinct forms. There is a shorter recension, a long recension, and a Syriac abridgment. The long recension, which is extant in Latin and Greek, is the first known. It was regarded as authentic up to the 17th century when the shorter recension was first published. And now it's recognized that the longer recensions is actually an interpolated text made in the 4th century. And so the sh so-called shorter recension which is extant only in Greek, which is the original language of these letters, is regarded as the authentic text. So, folks, if, if you go to, uh, like, Philip Schaap's Early Church Fathers, he might give both or all three of the recensions. It, the shorter one is the authentic one. So just keep that in mind. Now, uh, as Jurgen's Faith of the Early Father points out, that uh, these seven letters are packed with very remarkable indications about uh, Christian beliefs. Again, this is a hearer of the Apostle John. He knew St. Peter. Um, he's so close to the, the Apostles that he's a stellar witness to the early church. 
And he has a really clear-cut idea of the threefold uh, bishop, priest, and deacon uh, uh, layout, which, by the way, is the topic of our program. But I want to point out a couple of texts that are commonly cited from Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, for example, in his letter uh, to the Smyrnans in seven one, he says, They, the, this heretical group, abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins, in which the Father, in his goodness, raised up again. They who deny the, the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. So here we have a very strong affirmation of real substantial presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist. And also as a source of unity, too. Because notice when they deny the gift of God, they're perishing in their disputes. Also, he says elsewhere in four one, he says, Take care then to use one Eucharist so that whatever you do, you do in accord in according to God. For there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup in the unity of his blood, one altar, as there is one bishop with the presbytery and my fellow servants, the deacons. So there you also have an affirmation of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and also the sacrifice, sacrificial aspect of the Eucharist because there is one altar and then you also have the threefold division of bishop, priest, and deacons right there in one handy-dandy little quote. So, uh, yeah, folks, if you're going to be defending the faith, I highly recommend you go on newadvent.org or some other website. It's available for free. Read these seven letters from St. Ignatius of Antioch. They'll blow your mind. Uh, just the humility and the fact that he's writing on his way to martyrdom. I hear the music coming up, and that means that our good friend Bruce Sullivan is joining us. We're going to be talking about Bishop and Bruce. Stay tuned. Leviticus 11.44 says, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. St. Vincent Pilati said, You must be holy in the way God asks you to be holy. God does not ask you to be a Trappist monk or a hermit. He wants you to sanctify the world and your everyday life. May God show us the path to holiness and help us to follow it all the days of our life. Mom's going to have a baby? She is? Will it be a boy? Or will it be a girl? We don't know yet, but we heard the heartbeat, and my dad said this is going to be someone very special. You mean like being a president? Or maybe a doctor? Well, probably maybe like a singer or dancer, I think. Hello, my name is Mary Ann Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. 
Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, at Hands On Apologetics. And today we're going to be talking about an issue that it's not really clear in the New Testament. You know, in the New Testament it mentions bishops, which are called episcopoi, uh, or overseers. Also, it mentions presbyteroi, or elders we call priests. What's the role of one or the other? Is there a role? And it's kind of interesting that we just read Ignatius of Antioch. And I'm sure that's going to come into the mix. So to help us kind of straighten all this out, we have our good friend Bruce Sullivan coming on. Bruce, by the way, is a former uh, Church of Christ minister. And his book is Christ in His Fullness, where he outlines his journey of faith that took him from his roots as a Southern Baptist to the pulpits of Church of Christ. And ultimately, to experience Christ in His fullness in the Catholic Church, he's received back in 1995. He serves as a catechist of a local parish. He's a writer, speaker on related topics. He's been on EWTN, uh, and Mother Angelica Live, Journey Home, and also... Um, Hands-On Apologetics. So, Bruce Sullivan, welcome back to Hands-On Apologetics. Thanks, Gary. It's always great to be with you. Yeah. Hey, Bruce, you know, I I wanted to check on this. Uh, I didn't have it in the bio. Uh, Now, I know you were on track towards the diaconate. Is that still going on? God willing, I'll be ordained August 29th in Louisville. All right. Very good. So So it is on track, and, and you're on the road to the diaconate. Yeah, it's on track. Um, uh, it's going to be a, a different kind of ordination. No, no celebration afterwards. Just get to the parking lot and get home. <laughs> you know, so ordination with mask and all that, and limited number of people. But, uh, but yeah. you know, the archbishop wants to push through because there's work to be done. You know, he, you know, he's been training us for five years, and he's got there's jobs for us to do. You know, so we want to get busy and and start doing what we've been formed to do for the past five years. Yeah, yeah, very good. Actually, I just uh, attended uh, ordination to the priesthood uh, last month, and you know, with the mask and you know, social distancing, and of course, you know, they they didn't have the the usual celebration afterwards. But it's it's no matter what, it's a joyous celebration, isn't it? It is. It is. And yeah. so you know, we'll have a party some other time. Oh, yeah, there man. we go. There you go. So, uh, you know, it's been a little while since you've been on the program. Maybe you could just give us a real quick uh, thumbnail sketch of your journey into the Catholic faith. Okay. Yeah, you didn't tell me about that ahead of time. Good thing I, I know <laughs> this by heart. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, I, like you mentioned in the bio, I was raised as a Protestant, and, uh, and basically uh, I got into trouble about 27 years ago trying to convert some Catholics in our neighborhood and after a year or two of wrangling, uh, I said uncle, and uh, and became a and was into, received into the Catholic Church, and and the, the primary issue that really drove that. I mean, you know, prior to that time, I was an intensely anti-Catholic uh, person in my theology. Not that I had anything against Catholic individuals, but I really believed the Catholic faith could not be squared with the Bible. In fact, I believed that it was uh, uh, a deception straight from the pit of hell that would damn souls by the millions. And for that reason. My heartfelt desire was to be a missionary to a place like Brazil, the world's largest Catholic country. And uh, what kind of turned my apple cart over uh, in the process of of, uh, wrangling with these Catholic friends of mine was they gave me Carl Keating's Catholicism and Fundamentalism to read, and that was kind of like uh, the beginning of the end of my career as a Protestant minister. And and the thing in Keating's book that that really – uh, got me thinking was this whole idea of the approach to authority in the Bible, specifically uh, the canon of Scripture. How did I know that there were just 27 letters in the New Testament? Why not 29 and two are missing? Why not 25 and two shouldn't be there? You know, this is an important product, you know, question for someone who claims to be a Bible-only preacher. Uh, how do you even appeal to the authority of sacred Scripture while bypassing the authority of the Catholic Church? And so uh, eventually, through a couple, you know, a year or so, a couple of years of just agonizing over these things, um, you know, God gave me the, the grace of conversion because I do believe it's it's a grace. It's not simply an intellectual exercise. Um, yeah. Apologetics are important, but they're not the end of the story. The Holy Spirit has to be involved. Grace has to work in the hearts, and and through a retreat at the Coming Home Network uh, at Steuben, Francisco University in Steubenville, um, I had some uh, some powerfully moving experiences that kind of enlightened me, you could say, and I was received into the church in 1995 and, um, and spent the past 20 years, 25 years being 
a catechist and a layman, and, and but I, very early on I felt a, 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 a call to the document so I could continue to uh, serve God in the way that I, I think he intended me to serve in the church, which is a mouse. <laughs> um, you know, there's different parts of the body, and and you know, teaching and, and preaching has just you know been my passion. Um, you know, not for an ego reason, but because of believing that that's just you know what God has, has gifted me to do. And so, um, I'm I'm excited about that, and also in in serving whatever capacity uh, God chooses uh, as we move forward through this uh, doctrinal formation. Yeah, thanks be to God for that, because, uh, I mean, I have benefited so much from all the times you've been on the show. And and actually, you know, the, the topic in front of us is kind of a difficult one about, uh, yeah. you know, when you look at the New Testament, it's not really clear exactly what are the roles with the, you know, the, the overseers or bishops or the elders or priests. In fact, uh, for a lot of for a lot of Protestants, particularly if they're more of an you know, evangelical bent, they won't lose a lot of sleep over that. But if you're coming from a Church of Christ background, Christian Church background, or some kind of more fundamentalist background that's viewing the Bible as like a blueprint, and you're trying to practice some form of primitivism, thinking you have to restore, you know, practice what the primitive Church did, well, then they can lose sleep over this because they, they they see what they think are uh, that the Catholic Church's structure is uh, puzzling, if not problematic, for at least three reasons. Uh, in their reading of sacred scripture, they see the office of bishop, from the Greek word episkopos, and the office of presbyter, from the Greek word presbyteros, to be one and the same. And so they think the Catholic Church has separated something that was originally one. They also think that uh, a plurality of bishops should govern the local church rather than a single bishop over an entire diocese. And they often don't see the need for any kind of apostolic succession in their church leadership or structure. And so all these things they think uh, the Catholic Church, you know, brought into the picture, if you will, and 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 the Scripture, for example, there's many, multiple Scriptures I'll go to, but one that comes to mind is in Titus chapter one, where um, beginning in verse five, Saint Paul tells Titus, "I left you in Crete for this reason, that you should put in order what remained to be done, and should appoint elders, that's the word presbyteros, in every town as I directed you, someone who's blameless, married only once, whose children are believers, not accused of debauchery and not rebellious, for a bishop, episcopos." as God's stewards, must be blameless. And so here he uses these words interchangeably, it seems, because Deuteros, Episcopos, Bishop, uh, Elder. And so that's where those folks begin their case, if you will. Um, but there are some underlying assumptions that come into their equation, though, we can talk about. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, so there's three major uh, difficulties, you know, the— the, the role of uh, that perhaps they're both the same and that Catholicism separates it. Also, the the idea that there would be only one bishop and then apostolic succession. Is that correct? Correct. You know, that, those okay. are three objections they'd raise. And, of course, yeah. underlying all of them, though, is a, is, is a major assumption. That I, I think there's a slight possibility you've dealt with in the program before, uh, something called sola scriptura. Um, you've heard of that, right? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, we, we, we deal with this in, in some ways. When you're talking about talking to Protestants and fundamentalists, et cetera, you know, this, this, it, everything always comes back to that in a certain sense. Yeah. It comes back to authority because, you know, we, we have a revealed religion. So there, there's authority involved. And, and really the, the sola scriptura assumption is also underlying this problem as well, you know, that what they see as a problem, because they're assuming, again, that the Bible, by design— is like a detailed uh, handbook that has spelled out in black and white terms every single step, et cetera, that they use as a blueprint, rather than recognizing the Bible for what it really is, and that's a, a reflection or a glimpse into the faith of the early church. We're getting a reflection of it. We're, we're looking in on a uh, conversation, if you will. Um, and so that assumption alone, when you're talking to somebody about the subject, it's going to be hard not to touch on that a little bit, going into the whole idea of how do we know what we know, and, and do we know things about the early church that go beyond just my personal reading of sacred scripture. Yeah, that's a great point, because the New Testament never actually takes the time to define. You know, Paul doesn't say, oh, by the way, when I say episkopos, I mean, you know, the, the, that there's only one bishop in a particular location who does X, Y, and Z. You, you kind of get it secondhand where, uh, you know, he might exhort a bishop to do certain things, but never actually describe specifically what's the function of this particular office. 
it's, all, it's, it's assumed. It's assumed the readers yeah. know, and that comes back to this, one of the major oversights of Sola Scriptura is the failure to recognize that, you're, again, it's a conversation, and the Holy Spirit inspires members of the church to write to other members of the church about matters pertaining to church, all understood against the, the shared common knowledge of the, of the writer and recipient. And in this regard, you know, like, again, as a side note, you know, baptism is a perfect example of that. Baptism weighs heavily in the writings of the New Testament, but nowhere are you given a detailed description of actually what is done. It's just assumed, because everybody who's reading has been baptized. And so all these churches he's writing to, they have elders, they have presbyters, they have bishops. It's it, it just assumed. And so there's no need to go into a, a, a labored detail. Uh, so that is, that is one of the things that has to be pointed out in discussing it. Um, another detail, another aspect of this is, is the failure to appreciate the fact of the church's development, not only of her doctrine, but of her stru- structure, that development um, is, is a, uh, an aspect of any living organism, any living entity. And the church is the body of Christ. It's, it's a living organism, if you will, and she's undergone development not only in her understanding of the faith, but in even how things are structured and, and how she does business, if you will. Um, and I, I think we could touch on that a little bit, too, if you like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's let's dive into it because that's really important. But first, probably you should de- define what do you mean by development because people would think uh, there you go. Uh, changing something, you know, that uh, wasn't that- there, you put something new in. The way, the way to think about development, in my opinion, is to actually – first say what it's not. When the church speaks of development, she's not talking about pulling rabbits out of the hat, you know, uh, something that wasn't there. Voila. The only thing we have that's creation ex ex nihilo is in Genesis, (laughs) you know, something (laughs) from nothing. But the the church's doctrine doesn't come from nothing. It's a deposit of faith. So uh, Jude verse 3 talks about the the faith, once for all deposited with the saints, that then the the saints contemplate. So that, for example, the best way to describe how development in in doctrine, for example, works in my mind, is taking the example of St. Peter himself. You'll recall in Acts chapter 1, on the day of Pentecost, when he was preaching that first gospel sermon, if you will, of the church, uh, he said, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. He was citing the prophet Joel. And he says, This promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's in Acts chapter 2, where Peter is basically preaching the fact that the gospel, the gospel message is something that will be for all flesh, for everyone, all, even those who are far off. And yet Peter himself did not personally grasp the implications of what he was saying, because later on we get to Acts chapter 10. Whoops, here's the music. We'll have to take it up when we get back, right? Okay, yeah, that, that's a good cliffhanger. Uh, we're chatting with Bruce Sullivan about the role of uh, bishops and priests in the New Testament. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back. This is Jesse Romero from the Terry and Jesse Show, also from Jesus 911. Let's face it, we all need to use the internet, but we need screen accountability. Why? Pornography is a huge problem, especially on the internet. And every time we tap into the internet, we get bombarded with images and temptations that degrade our humanity. So we need Covenant Eye to block these pornographic sites and advertisements from infiltrating our lives. Covenant Eyes helps us take custody of our eyes and custody of our intellect. So I recommend you go to CovenantEyes.com and type in the promo code BMPR to support the network. Protect yourself and your family from the eminent threats on the internet. www.CovenantEyes.com Code VMPR Live Porn Free. Thank you for listening to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Thank you. God bless you. Keep the faith. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us by going to smile.amazon.com. 
and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year round. May God bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Bruce Sullivan about uh, the role of bishops and priests in the New Testament. And Bruce, like right before the break, you were mentioning how in Acts during uh, Peter's sermon, how he talks about the God bestowing the Spirit in the last days, quoting the prophet Joel. But as you were just about to mention, you know, it, even he didn't, fully realize the ramifications of that, did he? No, he didn't. And he, he just preaches and be poured out in all flesh, etc. And then in Acts 10, we have the familiar story where the he had a vision of a sheet being let down from heaven filled with all kinds of unclean animals, a Jewish unclean in the Jewish law, and he was asked to kill and eat, and he, he refused like three times until he finally got the message. And about that time, you know, folks from Cornelius' his house came, who was a Gentile uh, and a Roman, and he goes to his house, and he says, Truly I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So, so, so Peter had his aha moment. You know, what he had preached before was now the implications were clear to him, and he shared it with the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. And so the point being how development occurs, the, the idea that Gentiles were going to be included in the plan of God was implicit all the way from the beginning. The prophet Joel, long before Christ, had, had, had prophesied that, but it wasn't made explicit in the church's understanding until the baptism of Cornelius all the way up in Acts 10. So we see the church developing you know, in her understanding of that one deposit of faith. We see the same thing when we come to the structure of the church. For example, when you look in the book of Acts, in chapter, Acts chapter 6, you know, we have the first deacons being selected. Now, I don't recall anywhere in the Gospels Jesus saying anything about his church having deacons, you know, an office of deacons. Uh, uh, and yet the church uh, instituted them as a practical response to a church need. We get to Acts chapter 15. We find the church holding a council. I don't recall anything in the Gospels talking about church councils getting together. And yet at the same time, here we have a practical response to a need in the church. And so, you know, the point is the book of Acts testifies to the fact that the church has been in a process of development ever since its founded day of Pentecost. And so why would we assume that no uh, need for further development uh, was, was called for after the close of the first century, basically? Right, yeah, because ultimately, you know, the church is facing new challenges, new questions, like uh, whether uh, you still had to be circumcised once you become a Christian and follow the Mosaic Law, like in Acts 15, or even, uh, you know, uh, converts with uh, household baptisms. When those children grew up, what about their children? Do they get baptized as infants or do they get baptized as adults? You know, that doesn't take place till after the, the New Testament era. Correct. And so it's something that we do see the church, you know, as a living entity starting out, you know, as an infant, if you will, in Pentecost, developing and under, growing in understanding, growing in practical things. You know, when we're talking about deacons, bishops, priests, we're talking about, you know, practical things. Yes, you know, you know they're, they're theologically important in terms of um, the office and what, uh, you know, Christ leaving, for example, priests to celebrate the Eucharist, etc. But how things are arranged, how things are organized becomes a practical matter that we see the church actually experiencing when she appoints deacons, when, when they ha- she holds a council. And, and then later on, you know, as, as the church moves on, how to arrange even dioceses, etc. These are practical concerns. And we see, like you've already mentioned, that by the end of the first century, you know, this, this is pretty well established, this distinction between deacons, bishops, priests, 
uh, you already cited uh, Ignatius of Antioch. Um, uh, you know, Ignatius, you know, it, it, scholars debate when he was, the, he was a martyr, somewhere around 108, 110, something like this. And he speaks, in one citation I like is from the Tralian, the letter to the Tralians. In like manner, let everyone respect the deacons as they respect Jesus Christ. And just as they respect the bishop as a type of the father and the presbyters as the council of God and the college of the apostles, without these, it cannot be called a church. And so, you know, we find this distinction being referred to in a, in a matter of fact way in 108 AD when he's writing these letters. And, and that's the thing I like to point out is when someone sees a letter like St. Ignatius of Antioch is dated 110 AD. Well, that's not saying he's make, that's nothing he's making up in 110 A.D. He's speaking of this as an established reality that predates him so much so that it's just assumed by everybody. You know, so this goes back into the apostolic era. This distinction of between deacons, priests, and bishops. Yeah, because the the New Testament um, is kind of like a snapshot of the early church, and it's like you know assuming that a child never grows beyond the what's in a snapshot, right? Because Right afterwards, Ignatius of Antioch is so explicit about these things. And like you said, it's a matter of fact, like everybody knows this. Yeah, he's not, he's not making something up. It's not like he's innovating. Uh, as we know, the early Christians were martyrs precisely because they were not innovators. They were defending yeah. the faith that they've been given, were willing to die for. And so they're not innovators in that sense, trying to just, you know, uh, playing loose, put loose and fancy free with the truths of the faith. And so when he speaks of this as being already well established, we're talking going back into the age of the apostles. Um, what um, and usually also again, you know, closely related to this is like we mentioned before, the idea of apostolic succession. You know, not only do fundamentalists, Church of Christ, and others have problems with you know maybe making distinctions between bishops, deacons, presbyters, etc. Uh, they don't get or understand or accept why the Catholic Church believes that those offices depend upon something called apostolic succession. And yet, that's exactly what we see in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so apostolic succession in itself it also causes a problem too, because it's. Uh, but then, you know, that's one of those problems that didn't exist in the New Testament because the apostles were still alive, you know, except for Judas. And yeah, you know, uh, the issue of okay, well, what's going to happen once they die? Uh, you know, then you know the early church fathers are really interesting because first Clement who uh, was a bishop after St. Peter, recounts how the, the apostles knew that they were going to, their lives were going to end, and therefore they instituted apostolic succession. It's something, you know, we, we see it, you know, first in action, in Acts chapter 1, when they chose Matthias to succeed Judas. Yeah. And, the, where, and where, where fundamentalists, uh, you know, uh, go with apostolic succession, they hone in on that because they look at the, the prerequisites uh, that, 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 that the apostles had for choosing someone to fill Judas's office. And they say someone who'd been gone in and out with this from the, you know, from the very beginning, they'd been, been, been part of the, the company of the apostles with Jesus. And, and they'll say, well, see, no one, no one can fulfill that requirement today. So there's no apostolic succession. And yet what they're, they're doing there is they're missing the point that in Acts chapter, chapter one, they're talking about, you know, that, that office of the 12, but that's missing the point that Catholic apostolic succession is not saying that these guys were witnesses of Jesus Christ, you know, 200 years later, but that they're continuing in that ministry, in that office, which we see witness to in uh, Paul's, for example, subsequent writings, where he speaks of the laying on of his hands on Timothy. He tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 6 that, you know, to rekindle the gift that, of God that's within you through the laying on of my hands. He then instructs them in that same letter uh, in chapter 2 to entrust the faithful men uh, the things that had been handed unto him. And then he also admonishes them uh, to advise them not to lay hands on or ordain anyone hastily in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, so as to not participate in the sins of others. And so we see this process going on of the laying on of hands, of leaders being appointed, being set up in every church, and uh, all of that is a form of, of apostolic succession, succeeding in the ministry of the apostles, namely in the ministry of, of governance of the church, of teaching, of the ministry of the sacraments. And that's what we mean. What we do not find anywhere in the Bible, however, is a typical Protestant model, and that is where groups of individuals get together, form their own congregations, and then simply vote on leaders from their membership 
and institute them as bishops and presbyters. We don't see that anywhere in the Bible, um, and, and which means ultimately that uh, Protestant bishops, if you will, Protestant ministers, if you will, evangelists, are self-appointed. Because all I do is I, I, I basically am appointed by the congregation of my own choosing that believes what I believe, et cetera, et cetera. It's not this apostolic succession connection going back to the beginning whereby the integrity of the faith is ensured from generation to generation. Yeah, yeah, very good. So even if you take the sole scriptura model, you end up where uh, the Protestant option is, you know, even worse. It's it's totally out of sync with Scripture because you don't see anything like uh, congregationalism or anything like that. Well, I've got I got some friends right now that are good friends, are good Christian people who I love, and and they are Protestants and they uh, haven't been able to find a church that they. Uh, uh, that they agree with, or for whatever reasons, and so now they're meeting in their home, <laughs> and, yeah. and and primarily their family and friends. And it's like, and, and and they say, well, we don't really have any appointed leaders. Well, I guarantee the leaders are the ones who own the house, basically. <laughs> right. But 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 the point is, you don't find that in the Bible. While while there were con- while there were Christians who met in homes because that's all they had at first, uh, it's not the same thing, you know, as to later on after the fact that the church is established, we just pull away, meet in our homes. Uh, organize ourselves, get a corporation number, and select leaders. That is not a model you can find anywhere in the Bible. Instead, you find uh, uh, Jesus appearing to Paul and, and appointing him an apostle. Paul laying his hands on Timothy. Paul then telling Timothy about how to lay hands on other men. We find this chain going on of succession, and if for no other reason, it's showing that we are really tied to the church. The church is not about a lone ranger approach to Christianity. We are tied to a living organism, the mystical body of Christ, and that ensures the integrity of teaching, the continuity of the sacraments, and it, it itself being a sacrament, an apostolic succession, so through ordination. So um, that's the Bible model. The only problem is it's an inconvenient truth once you've broken the apostolic succession by becoming like a Protestant or something. Once you've broken the apostolic succession, uh, it's an inconvenient truth. <laughs> That's the best way I'll yeah. describe it. Yeah, and especially as a former Church of Christ minister, I, you know, Church of Christ, the, the emphasis on church unity, it was a unifying movement. And if you see apostolic succession, you can see how all the churches are unified because they are all come from a common uh, laying on of hands and instruction and appointment, where actually if you don't have that, then you end up with disunity. Yeah, so, so the, even the most well-intended of unity movements, which I believe the Stone Campbell movement uh, from which the Church of Christ came was precisely yeah. that, a very well-intended movement. It became a very divisive movement for that very reason. Yeah, very good. We're chatting with Bruce Sullivan about the role of bishops and priests in the New Testament. More to come on the other side of the break, folks. You're listening to Hands on Apologetics. We'll be right back. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. 
healthcare news today seems to be coming from everywhere and everyone. It's confusing at least and untrustworthy at the worst. Dr. Aceta is a faithful Catholic in the Kern County community. He is trustworthy, well-researched, and will only give expert opinion on matters in his own specialty. Catholic teaching at its entirety is of utmost importance to Dr. Aceta. Give Dr. Aceta a call for your obstetrics and gynecological needs at 661-695-6617. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody. We're chatting with Bruce Sullivan, former Church of Christ minister, now on his way to the Catholic diaconate. And we're talking about the role of bishops and priests in the New Testament or overseers and elders in the New Testament. And uh, Bruce, yeah, the, it's interesting how all those factors kind of come to play when it comes to looking at the question of what exactly are the roles of these things in New Testament, like Sola Scriptura, apostolic succession, uh, development within the church. They all they they do serve to kind of obscure exactly what's going on at the earliest stages. Yeah, it, it can, and and of course, as we know, as 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 it as it has shaken out, if you will, you know, we, we've come to see you know the those roles you know more distinctly uh, developed uh, as the church reflects upon them and 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 lived out that reality, so that we see in the bishop the uh, the fullness of holy orders. You know, the one who's you know. You know, is more in the person of Christ there in 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 the midst of his, the church, who then appoints other men to be priests, who who administer you know uh, most of the sacraments except the holy orders, and and then the deacons who you know are are serving in other capacities. You know, we, we we've developed those distinctions now in terms of the ministry, and even those took time to develop in the church. There you know, there's there's different times where you see different roles of deacons in the earliest church sometimes, and so it's something that the church. Um, has been, you know, developing over the centuries, and yet at the same time, it's all witness to there in its nascent form in the scriptures. But the scriptures themselves, like we've already noted, don't provide a detailed, um, structured analysis for us. Um, right. right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, even terminology, uh, you know, those words right. now have a very strict view. Where if you look at the meaning, like a uh, uh, elder could be an overseer, and an overseer could be an elder. I mean, there is a sem uh, semantic overlap between those two terms, so you can see how they could be used interchangeably. You know, before they become formalized into this word means this particular office and only that office. And, and it, it not only is that true, which is a good point, but also the word that we translate deacon. Diaconia sometimes, you know, that, that, that word even in the New Testament sometimes, when's it being used referring to someone who had a, an ecclesiastical office, if you will? When's it being used just as service in general? You know, yeah, uh, the, sometimes, sometimes that's not even clear. You know, I will say this, you know, I, 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 before I forget, and that is, you know, sometimes people who struggle with the church's hierarchical structure, you know, Protestants looking in at it, etc., sometimes, you know, they're disturbed by the external trappings, if you will. And, and if someone were to ask, is the church's hierarchical structure of bishops, priests, and deacons, is, is that something that can be subject to abuse? Well, the answer is, is absolutely yes. <laughs> yes, it can be. Yes, it can. There can be such a thing as clericalism in the church, uh, which mm -hmm. Pope Francis has called a leprosy, okay? You know, so the church is always, you know, anytime you have structure, anytime you have appointed leaders, you have the possibility or corrupt leaders. Uh, Paul even said that in Acts chapter 20, I believe it was, uh, to the Ephesian church before he left, he talked to the Ephesian elders and said that among their own number, from their own number, would arise grievous wolves, not sparing the flock. And so that's, that's been a problem, you know, from the beginning, goes back even into the Old Testament, you know, the Caiaphas, the high priest, who was the one who basically was, you know, was leading the way, putting Jesus to death. 
Uh, in John chapter 9, he, he, he actually prophesies, it says, and, and, and speaks a, a, a profound truth because of his office, even though he himself may be a corrupt individual. And so I will readily admit to anybody that, yes, you know, the, 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 the structure and offices of the church, they can be subject to abuse. That doesn't undermine their legitimacy. Excuse me, legitimacy. What it does underscore, however, is human frailty. And, and that's why um, we have our confidence in the mercy of God and thank him for the sacrament of holy orders, whereby we receive sac- sacraments like reconciliation and the Eucharist. Um, but that's just something I thought I needed to actually point out. Yeah, yeah, very good point. I mean, it's uh, 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 house, hospital workers, you know, doctors uh, could be could abuse yeah. the system, but yeah. that doesn't mean we get rid of doctors, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so it, it's there. It, it, it's a great gift. And we've had many leaders of the church who are martyrs and pour themselves out, and you've got some that you know, yeah. pulse in the power of the flock. But the point is, it's all there in the Bible, and, and, and the, the, the Catholic model more clearly mirrors. It's a reflection of what we see in the Bible as opposed to a do-it-yourself, homespun, Protestant variety where we just kind of get together and have a committee and, and, and form our own structure, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, on your journey to the Catholic faith, uh, was this a big obstacle for you? And if so, uh, what were the steps that kind of helped you deal with it? It was an obstacle at first, just because, again, of the propensity to try to find everything backed up in Scripture, if you will. And, 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 and when you're first doing something on that journey, you have to even realize that maybe your own assumptions about Scriptures may be uh, flawed or short, you had shortcomings to them. And so recognizing the assumptions I had made um, uh, was part of it. But ultimately, you know, it, it came down to several things converging, showing that, hey, the Catholic faith, is the faith I read about in the Bible. I can trace it in every, in every single century. The church is who she claims to be. And so therefore, even on some areas that at first I was less than clear on, I'll accept and later on they gel. I will say this along those lines, even Protestants trying to form a, a precise biblical model, they don't even know sometimes how to interpret certain passages. St. Paul, when he speaks to Timothy about the qualifications for a bishop or for an elder, he says he must be the husband of one wife, having children who believe. Well, that's, that's not as straightforward of a requirement as it sounds. Does that mean he has to be married? Or if he is married, he has to have, have been married only one time? Or if he's married, he has only one wife at a time? Does it mean he has to have children? Or if he has children, they have to believe? Does he have to have a plurality of children? If he has five children, do all of them have to believe? That's, is that what children who believe mean? Or if he has three out of five believe, does he have children who believe? You get the point I'm making. Even a, yeah. a supposedly straightforward requirement, like he has to be the husband of one wife, and have children to believe, that itself is subject to interpretation as to what is he getting at here. And, and so that's why even going, trying to make the Bible a blueprint, you go by separate and apart from the lived reality of the church, the sacred tradition and our practice is, is hopelessly flawed from the get-go because those questions cannot be answered just by the Bible alone. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And I know that is a, a big sticking point, too, as far as a husband and one wife. Of course, you know, back then th- there was polygamy. So, you know, yeah. it, it, maybe uh, yeah. it's forbidding polygamous uh, uh, man from becoming a bishop. Yeah, or, or, or yeah. divorce, remarriage, or do I have to answer? There's, there's, yeah. there's like 10 questions I could come up with around those two simple statements that are hard to answer. I'll maintain impossible to answer just by the text alone, because the clues aren't there. You're making assumptions. Yeah. Did the did the early church fathers play a role for you? I mean, I, that's kind of off Absolutely. the radar screen. Uh, yeah, uh, go into that a little bit. They played a huge role. They played a huge role simply because once I realized that on any particular passage of Scripture I was considering, whether it be, for example, what the church had to say about the Eucharist or or about elders and bishops, etc., once I realized that there's more than one way to interpret a passage of Scripture, you know, in other words, more than one way that had equal plausibility sometimes, you know, where could I go? You know, the fathers became the extra-biblical witnesses. The fathers, to me, became those guys you're saying, look, you know, you know, that Johnny and I disagree about what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body, this is my blood in Matthew 26. But then we go to the writings of the earliest Christians on record outside the Bible, and when they all seem to have a uniform position that says, oh, this, this, is, this is not ordinary bread, this is not ordinary wine, this is the body and blood of Christ, 
That's how the fathers factored in because they clarified how the earliest Christians on record understood it. Um, and, and I know one time one of my, my former instructors in the Church of Christ, he kind of mis, he misrepresented uh, my approach to the fathers by saying that I preferred the fathers to the scriptures. I said, not so, not so. The fathers become a witness to what, how the earliest Christians understood the faith witnessed to in the scriptures. So I don't place the fathers above the scriptures, but they become a reliable source to see how did the earliest Christians understand what we read in scripture. And that, to me, is extraordinarily valuable. And to, to ignore them is to stick your head in the sand, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point, because uh, ultimately it's, you're not treating these as inspired documents, but if, if there was one particular interpretation that Jesus and the apostles left, you would expect that interpretation to be the norm in the, the subsequent church, right? Correct, unless you just want to believe that, you know, you know, Christ established a church, and before the ink was dry in the first letter of the New Testament, it had already apostatized beyond recognition, which then means Jesus set out to do something that he didn't accomplish. <laughs> He's going to establish the church, the kingdom of God is going to go out, and, 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 and the whole project flopped within a few years. Well, that, that's impossible. So, you know, unless you take that approach, which there are some people who do, but they haven't thought through the implications of that, in my opinion, you have to recognize that going to the early writers of the, of the church, going to those early fathers, even though they're not sacred scripture per se, they are witnesses to what the early church believed universally. And that has incredible value, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, it, it kind of, it, it assumes that yeah, the church is a real historic entity. It's not just, uh, you know, something that yeah. you kind of just pull off the pages of Scripture, but it's a living community that continues throughout time. That's why St. Augustine said he would not believe the Gospels were not for the authority of the Catholic Church. Now, that might sound scary at first to some, but a Protestant hears that. He's not saying that he's putting the Catholic Church above the Scriptures, but he's saying, why would I believe the Gospels? If there wasn't this living entity called the church that's handing them to me, you know, yeah. he's living in the fourth century, 300 years past the time of Christ. Why would he believe this thing called the Gospel of John that he finds in a, in a library someplace if there wasn't this church that existed that was presenting it to it and authenticating it and saying, this is real, this is true, this is what we believe? And so, you know, to take the Bible apart from the church is, is really, you know, in my opinion, it's even worse to limp. It's just a false flat on your face. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, then you get critical uh, scholars who want to reject certain books because, uh, you know, they, they don't think they're authentic because they're just basing on the text alone and not, you know, the history of the church. Um, yep. Well, Bruce, I, I can't believe it, but, you know, the show has already flown. Uh, where can people go to get a hold of uh, Christ in His Fullness? Uh, Amazon or the Coming Home Network International, CRH. Uh, network.org or Amazon. They ought to be able to find a, a copy somewhere. All right. Thank you. All right. That's Thanks. great. And it's an awesome book, too, by the way. People pick it up. Christ in His Fullness. Uh, thank you so much, Bruce, for coming on. It's been fantastic. Thanks for having me. I love it. Have a great time. All right. Bruce Sullivan, ladies and gentlemen. Man, the hour has flown. Uh, by the way, coming up this week, we're going to have Eric Ibarra come on. We're going to talk about Photius and the East-West Schism. John DeRosa, Steve Dawson and Steve Clifford talking about Mormonism. So a lot in store for us this week. Thank you so much for listening. By the way, coming up next, the Terry and Jesse show coming at you. Uh, it's time for me to shut down the Midwest Command Center here, turn off the dojo lights. Thank you so much for listening. God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat. And that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. 
I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church. So I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.